The double doors of 98 Pelham Street opened to the latch key of their owner, who, to judge from his habiliments, had just returned from a funeral. The butler who advanced to meet him in the outer hall and take from him his neatly rolled umbrella, his top hat with the deep mourning band, and his close-fitting black overcoat, damp with rain, for one cannot hold up an umbrella during the actual committing of the body to the ground, endeavored to put into his expression the exactly right proportions of sympathy and deprecation. The problem was not an easy one and he had given a lot of thought to it while awaiting his master's return. Too much sympathy was very definitely not called for, but on the other hand, too much deprecation would be in bad taste and probably resented as indicating an over-intimate acquaintance with painful private affairs. He finally decided to have both expressions ready and take his cue from his master's countenance. But that impassive, cadaverous visage told him nothing. In fact, his employer might as well have been hanging his hat on the hat stand as placing it in a human hand for all the indication he gave of recognizing the presence of a fellow being who presumably had an immortal soul. Hugh passed and passed through this wide inner hall and into his study, shut the door behind him, and helped himself to a drink from the cocktail cabinet. He needed it. He flung himself into an enormous armchair beside the hearth and extended his feet to the electric fire. The soles of his shoes, wet with churchyard clay, began to steam. He never heated them. He sat motionless, staring into the glow, endeavoring, if the truth were known, to solve exactly the same problem that had so severely taxed his butler. He had just returned from the funeral of his wife, who had been killed in a motoring accident. That is no uncommon occurrence. Most men have wives, and motoring accidents are frequent. This was not quite an ordinary motoring accident. The car had gone up in flames. And though the proprietor of the Red Line Hotel at whose gates the accident had occurred had well known to him as frequent visitors for several years, or, no, excuse me, he, he identified that... The, the proprietor of the Red Line Hotel identified the bodies as those of Mr. and Mrs. Thompson, well known to him as frequent visitors for several years past. An inscription inside the watch found on the man had identified him as Trevor Wilmot, one of Hugh Paston's most intimate friends. And an inscription inside the wedding ring of the woman had identified her as Hugh Paston's wife. Now, what should be the attitude of a husband at once outraged and bereaved? Should it be grief and forgiveness, or a disgusted reputed deation? Hugh Paston did not know. He only knew he had a severe shock, and was just beginning to rouse from the dazed numbness that had been a merciful anesthetic against the full stress of the blow. He had been hit on every tender spot on which a man could be hit. If Frida had left a note on her dressing table to say that she was eloping with Trevor Wilmot, he would have pitied and forgiven. But they were actually on their way home when the accident occurred. She had phoned to say she would be back in time for tea. Trevor himself was dining with them that evening. The thing had indisputably been going on for a considerable period. It must, in fact, have been going on from the earliest days of the marriage if the innkeeper's chronology were to be relied upon. Sitting there, sipping his drink and gazing at the impersonal glow of the electric fire, Hugh passed and began to go over things in his mind, asking himself what he felt and what he had better think. The soles of Hugh's shoes had long ceased to steam and were beginning to crack by the time he had finished reviewing his life with Frida in the light of what he now knew. He had believed that there had once been mutual love between himself and Frida, even if it had not stood the test of marriage. And he asked himself again and again what it was that had killed that love. Had marriage with him been a disillusioning experience for Frida? 
east side. Supposed that it was. So far as he knew, he had nothing undone that he could have done. But evidently, he had not filled the bill. He compared Trevor and Freda to Trishram and Isolt, and left it at that. He rose suddenly to his feet. One thing he knew for certain, he couldn't stop in the house. He would go out for a walk, and when he was tired, turn in at some hotel and phone his man to bring along his things. He looked around the room with its shadowless, concealing lighting and rectangular furniture, which contrived at one and the same time to be so austere and so bulky, and the jagged points in the pattern of the carpet and hanging stabbed at him like so many dentist drills. He went hastily out into the hall. The butler was not about, and he got his hat and coat unaided. He closed the big doors, silently behind him, set out at a brisk pace northward. By the time he had crossed Oxford Street and was making his way through the modified version of Mayfair that lies beyond it, he had slackened his pace. He had had precious little food or sleep since the inquest had revealed certain facts, and that is the thing which takes out of a man. Tired of going north, finding that the district was beginning to get sorted, he turned shop right. In another moment, he found himself in a narrow and winding street of shabby aspect, given up chiefly to second-hand furniture dealing in cheap eating houses. Hugh passed and made his way down this dingy thoroughfare slowly. His energy did not amount to a brisk walk. He had no wish to return to the deadly emptiness of his home. He found the curious old thoroughfare interesting enabling him to turn his mind away from the things on which he had been grinding for days. The rag bag stock and trade amused him, and he stood contemplating it. No one bothered him. No one importuned him to buy. Everyone was completely indifferent to his existence, which was as he wished it to be. Had he taken his walk abroad in Bay Fair, he would have been held at every turn by his friends, inquisitive and eager for information, or embarrassed and anxious to be kind, whereas the one thing he wanted was to be allowed to crawl away quietly and lick his wounds. He sauntered on, dislodged from his contemplation of early Victorian mantelpiece ornaments and oriental brummagum from the reek of the eating house next door and paused in front of a second-hand bookshop across the front of which the words J T no excuse me T Jelks T Jelks that's his name antiquarian bookseller showed faintly on the faded paint. The usual outside tables had been withdrawn owing to the heavy rain. Donkey, hey! Chill out. We're in this reading. We're at this bookshop. This antiqu antiquarian bookseller shop. We're just noticing it. Okay. So the usual outside tables at the bookshop had been withdrawn owing to the heavy rain. But a kind of bin stood just inside the narrow entry that gave access to a half glass door painted a faded green. The hard glare of an incandescent lamp immediately opposite supplemented the fading light of the stormy sunset and enabled the books in the bin to be examined in spite of the gathering dusk. It was an advantageous situation for a second-hand bookshop, thought Hugh for the stock required no great amount of light for its display, and the owner could very well let the borough council do his illuminating for him. He began to pick over the contents of the bin idly, previous experience having taught him that no lively Latin or eager Hebrew would shoot out to try and sell him something. But that everything was sunk in decent Anglo-Saxon indifference to business. Picking over the books in a two-penny 
Ben is an amusing business, providing one does not mind getting dirty. The assortment consisted chiefly of antiquated piousness and fly-blown fiction. A local lending library had apparently been disposing of discarded volumes, and by the time a local lending library thinks a volume is ripe for disposal, it is decidedly fruit. He picked over the diggy composing literature doubtfully, but failing to decipher the titles, decided not to imperil his eyesight with the contents. A reasonably clean blue binding heaved up from the wet welter like a log in rapids, and he fished for it, hopefully. It proved to be a battered library edition of a popular novel long since out in a pocket reprint. He dipped into it by the light of the glaring incandescent Incandence behind him. Incandence. Incandence. He knew by the name on the binding that it would be readable, and the title intrigued him. The Prisoner in the Opal. It raised visions. He soon found the paragraph that gave the book its title. The affair gave me quite a new vision of the world, he read, and I saw it as a vast opal inside which I stood, an opal luminously opaque, so that I was dimly aware of another world outside mine. There was a curious fascination in the rhythm of the prose, and he read on, hoping for more. But he did not find it story then became, apparently, a detective novel, with the amiable Hanad prancing gaily through it. He began to wonder whether the wrong inside had got bound up into those grubby blue covers. Such things do happen at printing works upon rare occasions. He skimmed on, unable to catch the drift of the story from his dippings, for it was full of mystery as an egg is of meat. He therefore turned to the end, knowing that there has got to be a solution somewhere to even the most mysterious of detective novels. A good detective novel was what he wanted at the moment, something sufficiently exciting to catch the attention and sufficiently intelligent to hold it. He dipped and skipped, preservingly cursing the well-maintained mystery that baffled him. He would soon have read the entire book if it went on like this, and again and again he was puzzled by the fact that the book appeared to bear no conceivable relationship to its title, and had almost fallen back upon his original hypothesis of a binder's error when he lit upon the clue and read, startled and absorbed, the account of the black mass celebrated by the renegade priest and the dissolute woman. Here was something that would certainly both hold the attention and intrigue the intellect. Hold on one second, I got a call coming in from John. John the Baptist.